All thanks and praise is due to God. We seek God's help and forgiveness. We seek refuge in God from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. Whoever God guides will never be led astray, and whoever God allows to go astray will never find guidance. I bear witness that there is no God but God, alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is God's servant and God's messenger. O you who believe, be mindful of God, as is God's due, and make sure you devote yourselves to God to your dying moment. Quran chapter 3, verse 102. <sighs> Sorry, I've never heard such a beautiful adhan this like Oscar it, but mashallah, wow. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, so I'm here to talk about today uh, Allah's gift of rest and restoration through prayer. Um, and I do this as a recovering workaholic. <laughs> Uh, someone who still is very much in the process for finding balance. And I'm in a room full of women. So I'm probably, it's probably safe to say that I'm probably not the only one. Um, so not too long ago, I was in a really dark place about this. I'd thrown myself into work for all sorts of reasons. A divorce, a sick mom, a challenging relationship, unresolved trauma, all of it. So I made my work my dean, my way of life. Allah, may God forgive us, may God forgive me. And I lay all my value and worth in what I could produce. <laughs> Although from the outside, it didn't look like that at all. Uh, I was moving up, I was getting promoted, I was getting paid, nonprofit paid, but paid nonetheless. <laughs> Making a name for myself in my niche of a sector. But inside, I was just barely getting by, using coping skills that just numbed me the heck out. And I wasn't praying. Not very much at all. Um, I barely went to the masjid, even though I worked right next door to one. And when I was there, I was pretty disengaged. I was going 110 miles per hour, and I didn't take any breaks. Or I took breaks, but I was not really on a break. Because I didn't really believe in them. I was burning the candle on both ends. Thankfully, Allah gave me an unanticipated out. A colleague suggested I take a class um, that she had tried for dealing with burnout called the Resilience Toolkit. Um, the Toolkit is a system of reducing stress and growing resilience. It teaches you how to recognize your own stress and relaxation cycles, helps you understand when your stress is helpful, but also when it can be harming, um, gives you a menu of stress reduction tools, gives you skills that hopefully turn into lasting habits that affect powerful transformation. The underlying idea is that stress and trauma affects not only your mind, but your body as well. Um, and so this is a more holistic way to address stress and trauma compared to cognitive or talk therapy, like top-up only um, modalities. But honestly, at that point, I wasn't interested in transformation. <laughs> my, my plan was to sustain the level of work I was doing, essentially enable my addiction to work. Stuck the law. May God forgive me. But Allah is the best of planners. And with that framework and those tools, I started to settle my nervous system and find myself more connected and more present in my body and improve my ability to self-regulate. Basically choose, practice, and coping skills that settled my body instead of checking me out or getting me reactivated. And I started to slow down and I even took breaks. So like I would take my 15 minute break and walk around work and not think about work. Um, and then when I started to, but then the part was, that part, <laughs> Um, all the feelings that I was numbing out, I started to feel them. And I discovered I had a lot of rage and a lot of sadness, mostly about the prison and nonprofit industrial complex, complexes, uh, both that I participated in, um, and especially at the people who were just too busy working or getting by to care about it, um, so much that oftentimes, albeit unconsciously, they re-traumatized the people that they were there to take care of. And I was especially mad at myself about participating in that. And I learned that I was so profoundly exhausted that actually one day after an especially long day of work, I couldn't walk another step, and I laid down in the middle of the concrete parking lot. Alhamdulillah, it was late, so there weren't any cars likely to hit me, but I didn't know that day if I was going to get up or when I was going to get up. Um, I really thought I was going to die that day. Alhamdulillah, with that force break Allah gave me, 
or what my body took for me uh, with the support of colleagues and a regular practice of the toolkit, I built the capacity to leave my job. I didn't know. But I quit without a plan. My parents who immigrated from the Philippines told me, I'm not going to say it because we're at Jumma, but basically they said I was mad to leave work like that. But my husband who saw my slow decline knew best but was also really worried for me. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners. And, he also, and for me, my, my, my connection with Allah, my Allah has a great sense of humor. Because not too long after, um, the person who taught me the resilience toolkit offered me a job facilitating it. So basically, Allah put me, my crispy critter burnt out self, in charge of helping people to find stress and relaxation in their lives. So basically, I had to, and the thing was, my boss mentor um, required us to embody the work that we did so that we could effectively share it. Because basically, we had to practice the tools because the framework showed people the ability, gave people the ability to recognize when they were stressed. And so when they could do that effectively, that means they could pick up on other people who were stressed, myself included. So there's like fantastic accountability structure that Allah gave me. Um, so, I uh, had work, but it wasn't enough work for me to avoid the deeper emotions and limiting beliefs that drove my workaholism in the first place. And those that basically where I was ashamed that I wasn't enough, that I wasn't deserving of love, including Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. So I sought to avoid these hard feelings through community work. Um, and this time I found myself in the masjid. I started attending with the plans of keeping myself busy. But again, Allah had better plans in store for me. The breakdown. Which of the signs of your Lord do you deny? The everyday stress of work, school, and family, and even heavier trauma from things like car accidents, the death of a loved one, or child abuse, all of this can disconnect us. Sometimes from ourselves, sometimes from each other, and even sometimes from Allah. Similarly, stress and trauma can even disconnect us from what's happening in our minds, in our bodies, and in our hearts. Thankfully, Allah has gifted us with the power of prayer as a means of rest and restoration. Prayer can restore our connection to our minds, our bodies, and our hearts, to each other, and to Allah. And the beauty of it is we've been receiving this gift of rest and restoration through prayer the whole time even if we weren't conscious of it, even if we didn't know cognitively. Verily, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. Chapter 13, verse 28, at the end of this khutbah, I'm sure everybody will know it by then. The view of, this, the view of prayer as rest is very, sounded very punk rock to me, very anti-establishment as a, as a person who's a recovering workaholic, especially when we live in this community, this world, in a very hyper-capitalist society that, where our value is so tied intimately to our productivity. Because if you think about it in Islam, rest isn't a recommendation, rest is actually a mandate, right? We're required to pray at least five times a day. In other words, we're required to at least take five to 10 minute breaks from the stress of the day, regardless of what's going on. Essentially, our deen has a built-in stress regulation system. Through the practice and evaluation of prayer, we're actually asserting our value is about our connection to Allah. Our worthiness of Allah's love pre-exists production and productivity. Some things in this life we don't earn. I mean, we live in Southern California. We have sunshine. We have I mean, good weather pretty much all year long. We have gravity. Things that like we don't, we don't, I'm not, I never was worthy to receive that or I never earned that, you should say, or I'd rather say. In fact, Allah just gave it to me. Allah just gave it to us because of our relationship with Allah. Just like, it's kind of analogous to uh, the baby in my womb. I'm kind of pregnant if you could see here. <laughs> um, and you know, she didn't do anything to earn my love. She's just there, and I just love her um, because of my relationship with her. So, in this way, I guess rest from a remembrance of Allah is a reminder. It's a pathway to forgiveness and closeness to Allah. 
It's a means of liberation from bondage to all else. So my initial insight came to me during Ramadan, during um, Ramadan last year, during Taraweeh prayer. It's a special prayer where the Khatib or the Quran reciter le- reads a 30th of the Quran every night during Ramadan. So just imagine you're somebody who doesn't speak Arabic, has limited Quranic vocabulary, and can read, aka identify letters, so you try to follow along in the Quran with the Imam. But you find yourself constantly behind, losing your place, anxious, and super frustrated. So that was me. Um, and you give up, so you make the intention to just listen. But now you're finding, you're finding it super difficult to focus. For some reason, every possible useless thing is running through your mind. If you practice meditation, because I'm kind of a similar concept. Um, So what's her iftar tomorrow, even though I just ate iftar? Uh, What am I going to wear for Eid? Did I leave the iron on? Did Cardi B actually say eating halal and driving a lamb? (laughs) That was me. I had to reel it back in. So I I took a note from an early convert playbook, or my early convert playbook, when I just learned, when I was just learning to pray, and alhamdulillah, the wonderful people said to me, if you don't know the words yet, just say Allahu Akbar, God is great, and think of things you're grateful for. So that's what I did. I reflected on the things I appreciated in my life. So the first thing that came to mind, although goofy, was how I was dressed. I was wearing leggings and like my grandma cardigan, and the fact that they had the fans on in the women's section. Alhamdulillah. And then I felt myself sigh. And I thought about how my new boss gave me a chance, and I was back here at the mosque in Long Beach that I grew up going to, and I felt myself sigh again. And then I thought about Imam Amin, who I could always confide in and who always welcomed me to the masjid with a big smile, no questions asked. And when bowing my head down one more time on, my floor in, on the floor in sujood, I had one more juicy sigh. And so I repeated this grateful gratitude mindfulness practice, and I felt myself sighing and yawning and sighing and yawning, and I thought, subhanAllah, glory be to God. These are the signs to know that my body is settling. So I learned this from work. My nervous system has come into a more restful state. Verily, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. Time for the next two real cool prayer repetitions. And this time I noticed something else. With every bismillah, with every collective ameen, with every subhana rabbi al azim, glory be to the most wise. We all took a breath in, and then we all whispered our prayers aloud. Or underneath our breath, not, to, not aloud, but we whispered it. And that's just how you recite prayer, whether you're a tajweed master, Quran recitation master, or all you know is ameen. And, okay, why was this mind-blowing? So what? I learned from work that when you breathe in, your heart beats faster. When you breathe out, your heart beats slower. So when you extend your out-breath, you are, in essence, slowing down your heart. Verily, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. And then we came to the end of prayer. Time for salams, salutations of peace. Right? To the right, to the left. Or to the right, for Maliki. And... Whoa, another, mind, another part of my mind being blown. Moving the neck to the left and right, or just moving it in large sweeping motions, signals to the vagus nerve, our 10th cranial nerve, um, that controls our fight, flight, freeze response that's connected to all important parts of our body, including our heart, signals it's safe, and so slows down our heart. Which of your, of your Lord's signs do you deny? When I thought of this, or when I, I don't know, reflected and re- realized this, I was just like, my mind was blown. I didn't have words. Um, and I tell my husband sometimes, Allah removes the veil and you're able to see the other side. And this was one of those moments. Alhamdulillah, praise be to God. And it was because in these moments I was restful, enough to notice and make the connections. Another ritual where this concept of settling the body comes up is when we make wudu, ritual washing. So unless you're those guys in college that make weird challenges about who can maintain wudu throughout the day, you're probably doing it at least four to five times a day, right? 
And sometimes if you're having a really exciting day, you're going to have to do gusol or ritual bathing. So I'm a kind of a really kinesthetic person. It's really hard for me to just like be in one place right now. So let's do wudu together, not with, without water, but let's do it together, okay? So the first part, we make our intention. So that's we make our niya, we remember Allah, and then we do our hands, right? Well, imagine there's water, okay? Then the right hand and then left hand, right? And then mouth, and then nose, and then face, right? Usually it's two hands. And then your arms from elbow, right? It's three times, and then three times. And then our head, and then our ears, right? Okay. What about ghusl? Same concept. Hands, private's not going to do that. Wudu, again. And then the water over our bodies three times. And then on the right side, water three times. On the left side, water three times. So I don't know if you're hearing the pattern there. But basically, the simple science of it was, because my mind was just exploding at this point. Uh, pardon the analogy. <laughs> um, but basically, when we use one side to touch the other side of our body, or, um, and then we repeat that. So basically, when we do that, that's crossing the midline of our brain. When we repeat it on each side, it's called isometrics. And then when we do those, especially when we do those in combination, we are signaling again to our bodies that we are safe. And so our heart slows down, our breath comes back to regular pace. We don't need the adrenaline and cortisol. Verily in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. This is even apparent in tayammum. I remember when I was first doing this research, I had to look up tayammum because 15 year old me understood wudu, understood ghusl. Like that makes sense if this started in a desert community, it makes sense. But why am I gonna use dust, right? But for those who are familiar with it, let's do uh, tayammum together. Let's put it in the, soil, in, the, in the dust. Then sometimes some people say you blow it off. And then it's on your face. And then it's right. And then it's left. Again, that crossing the midline. Again, that isometrics. Again, what does that do for us on a biological level? Things that we weren't even conscious of. We're just doing, right? So like 15-year-old me was like, wow, it makes sense. It's like I got the answer to Alif Lamim. Like, <laughs> so, I mean, and you know, some things are a mystery and some things we get to know what's on the other side. Alhamdulillah, and over time we are discovering these things. So, and we know this works because in our prayers, what are they often filled with? You could be in Jummah anywhere, in any part of the world, and what's going to happen? You're going to see people yawning, you're going to see people, or you're going to feel it yourself, yourself tear up. But not with, not, I'm not talking about crying. I'm talking about when you just tear and there's no narrative, there's no story. Uh, your stomach might growl, or you might sigh. These are all signs that our body is downregulating. Our body is settling. Our body is coming into a rest and digest mode. SubhanAllah. So the next time you have a brother or sister that tells you like, hey, you shouldn't be feeling tired or you shouldn't be feeling hungry because you're yawning and all of this. You should be alert and focused on prayer. Know that for yourself, that your body is worshiping Allah. It's literally finding comfort in the remembrance of Allah, even if your busy mind is not there yet. I say what I have said. May Allah forgive me and forgive all of us. So when I was uh, researching this to prepare for khutbah, because I've never had to do that before, I was like, you know, oh, I have to sit down and stand up. And I always wondered, like, why do we sit down and stand up in the middle of a khutbah that seems, you know, like you're interrupting something? And I was like, whoa, maybe it's another opportunity to rest. I don't know that that's necessarily the case, but this is something that I thought of. So, but so what? We're resting, we're settling our bodies, who cares, right? This, okay, that's great, that's good. No, yeah, it's a really big deal. Here's why. 
because it frees us up to build the capacity in a whole plethora of ways. When we're relaxed, when we're rested, obviously we have less stress. We don't have those excesses of adrenaline and cortisol. Sometimes that's necessary, but when we have an excess, what does it exacerbate? Hypertension, asthma, diabetes, stroke, a whole list of health conditions that are exacerbated by stress. When we're relaxed and rested, we can feel our feelings. Acknowledge them, move through them, process them. Even that hard stuff, that underlying stuff, right? That grief, the shame, the anger, the sadness. And we can compassionately witness ourselves and each other in the way that we ask Allah to compassionately witness us. So then these things have less power over us. And then we can work on our own healing, healing our unhealed traumas, both the stuff that happens individually, but also the stuff that happens within relationship, the interpersonal stuff, and the community level stuff, right? As well as the systems level stuff, because ultimately systems and institutions and community, that's all people. So when we're relaxed and rested, we're more loving, kind, patient, flexible, creative, productive, social, appreciative. It makes us better parents, kids, spouses, friends, loved ones, workers, bosses, bosses. And when we are relaxed and rested, ultimately, we're better Muslims. We can appreciate our blessings, even the ones that aren't actualized yet, but the ones coming our way. In essence, we can trust Allah more deeply. We can focus on what we can change, and we can forgive ourselves for that we can't, that which we can't. And I'll say it louder for the sisters in the back. We can forgive ourselves, not the sisters in the back specifically. And I'll say it again for the sister, the little sister inside. We can forgive ourselves. We can forgive ourselves. And we can actually receive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness in this month and in all months. We are closer to Allah. We are able to embody, embody Allah's attributes, being loving, forgiving, patient, generous, compassionate, and wise. That being said, sometimes we need stress, good stress, to help us finish a report, mobilize our muscles if one of our kids is running into oncoming traffic after a ball, to rush to Jummah prayer, to rush to success, to swerve out of the way if somebody cuts us off on the 110, to maneuver our way through rough parts of our neighborhood at night, or to build a capacity to recognize when we're in an unhealthy relationship, whether that's with work or a person, so that we can make moves to make sure that we're safer, and ultimately like, everybody is safer in that situation. And when those conditions, and that's, that's when those conditions are there, but that's also when the conditions, or that's when the conditions are there, that's when they aren't there, and that's when they're consistently there. That's when we can lean in to the rest and restoration that remembrance of Allah affords. Because remember that ayah says, the remembrance of Allah, right? There's so many ways we remember Allah, whether it's through prayer or through uh, dhikr or through walking in the park and tufak, you know, to, to reflect. Um, I just focused on prayer because I gotta keep it short, <laughs> um, speaking of. So um, as a re re recovering workaholic and a proponent of rest, I'm gonna give you some homework or a practice opportunity if you don't like homework. Um, and as my little early Eid present for you all. And so we'll make our, our prayer together, this prayer together, our lab. Um, so right now, if you want, and only if you want to, um, I'm gonna invite you to take a self-inventory. Okay? This is just a tool to help increase our self-awareness. You can use it before or after prayer or any other means of remembrance or other, any other means of coping, whether that's going for long walks or watching lots of episodes of Netflix, or whatever that is that you do to rest. We're talking to your favorite cousin. Um, just so that you know that is this means of um, coping actually helping you to settle, or is it checking you out, or is it getting you activated? And no shade if it's checking you out or getting you activated, just so then you know to, you need to use another one. If I visit with this cousin, she gets me real activated. So then I need to maybe go for a walk afterwards. So right now, I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes if you want. If you don't wanna close your eyes, pick a point to focus on. Maybe take a deep breath or two if you like deep breaths. 
that feels uncomfortable, no deep breaths. And notice what's on your mind. We're going to take a note from Ar-Rahman, the most merciful and compassionate. And do it without judgment, just notice what's on your mind. It can be the content or it can be the pace. I will invite you to turn your attention to your heart, your heart space, and notice in this moment what's on your heart. No judgment, just notice. Next, I'll have you turn your attention to your bodies and notice what feels pleasant in your body right now. It can be something really, really minutia, like the tips of your earlobes or your scalp. It could be something as broad as your back. But what feels pleasant? And we'll even visit ple uh, quickly with the unpleasant and notice what is unpleasant in your body in this moment. Is it the same parts it normally is? Different today? And lastly, I'm going to invite you to notice zero out of 10. 10 being the most stressed you've ever been. Zero meaning super relaxed and peaceful. In this moment, where are you at? And what in your mind, body, and heart lets you know that that's where you're at? Once you have that, maybe just give a light nod. Okay. When you're ready, take a deep breath or two, if you want, or just breathe regularly. And then I'll invite you to open your eyes. Yeah. So I'll invite you to do that self-inventory after prayer on your own, um, to just to take account of what this prayer, particularly today, has had an effect on your mind, body, and heart. Um, and I'm going to close with, may you enjoy the rest of this prayer and the rest of Ramadan, um, keeping Allah's beautiful gifts in mind. God commends justice, doing good, and, gener and generosity towards relatives, and God forbids what is shameful, blameworthy, and oppressive. God teaches you so that you may take heed. Quran, chapter 16, verse 90. Recite what has been revealed to you of the book and stay consistent in prayer. Indeed, prayer restrains the human from lewd and wicked behavior, but the remembrance of God is even greater, and God knows everything you are doing. Chapter 29, verse 45. Wakimah Sada. Let's perform the prayer.